<clears throat> All right, uh, so I've got the confirmation that um, my audio is on. I'm still having a bit of a difficulty with the screen share. All right, so the screen is up. We'll just wait a few minutes uh, just for people to join, and then we can start our talk.
<clears throat> All right. Um, I guess we will start. Um, my name is Dr. Salman Khatak. Um, I'm one of the ENT doctors. I work at the Queen Alexandra Hospital, Portsmouth, in the ENT department. Um, so the topic that we're going to discuss today is tracheostomy versus laryngectomy. And uh, so we we are only going to discuss it um, at a very basic level for anyone who's joining the ENT department as, a, as an SHO. Um, so we're just going to keep it nice and simple um, and discuss the few important things that we need to bear in mind when we um, start working as a as an, a regular ENT SHO. <clears throat> so as you can see the picture, the first thing that comes into anyone's mind after, you know, hearing the word tracheostomy or laryngectomy is airway and that suddenly gives you a lot of anxiety because uh, with your ABCs that's the first thing that would um, be be of the most um, crucial crucial importance so um, securing an airway is always the basic priority in any any emergency situation and that's the first thing you'd always go to um, right let's move forward um, so we get the contents for the presentation today is uh, a bit of introduction and um, anatomy about laryngectomy versus tracheostomy. Um, we're also going to discuss the major differences between the procedures <clears throat> and the appearance of it as well. Um, as these procedures um, have different outcomes and different um, care we're, we're going to discuss the type of tubes and the type of care that we'll need post-operatively um, and some of the basic do's and don'ts for SHOs um, and things things of importance to remember well when dealing with a tracheostomy or a laryngectomy patient and then at the end we'll discuss um, some question questions if there were any Right, so the most important thing, like I said earlier, a patent airway is really important in both elective and emergency situations to provide adequate oxygenation and ventilation. So this is what your uh, your care would be revolving around in the first place whenever you get a patient. Um, and that's something that would you know, essentially keep us alive as well. Um, it is essential to know the basic anatomy and the differences uh, between a laryngectomy and a tracheostomy to avoid catastrophic events. And uh, it requires different management and different care altogether. So it's really important to know uh, the big differences between these procedures and uh, how the anatomy will look like after the procedure is done. Um, because not only uh, will you come across patients who may need a tracheostomy or a laryngectomy, but you'll also see patients with post-op complications turning up to the emergency department for, and you'll be expected to come up with a basic, um, you know, plan to begin with. And um, um, so it'll be it'd be really helpful for you to know um, what the basic steps you. Um, want to take before um, you know getting into big trouble with regards to the airway right so we will discuss the let's go back a little bit and uh, just have a look generally at the first picture here so that's the oral cavity here um, I hope you can see my mouse cursor there and that's the nasal cavity at the back of the nasal cavity you've got the nasopharynx um, then the oropharynx is just behind the tongue and then uh, just where the epiglottis starts we can call the region below that the hypopharynx um, and then the larynx again is um, 
an apparatus that is formed of cartilages, ligaments, and muscles, and all together, um, it is um, essentially the voice box um, in, in common terms. And it is suspended down um, from the hyoid bone via the um, thyrohyoid uh, membrane. So it's got a few basic uh, functions and very important ones um, for us to lead a normal life. Um, the first one is phonation, which means speech. So um, as we know, the larynx has got the vocal cords which control um, our speech. So when it's partially open, um, air can come out through the lungs and it vibrates the vocal cords and according to the adjustment of the vocal cords, um, a voice could be um, produced. Then controlling airway and breathing. So complete opening or closure is, is the um, other important function of the larynx and the vocal cords. Um, so we need patent um, airway through the vocal cords to be able to breathe normally. Um, and then lastly, um, protect, protecting the tracheobronchial tree. So to be able to breathe normally, we would, um, um, you know, uh, we would want to avoid any foreign bodies or food or drinks, liquids of any sorts to uh, not go down while we are eating. Um, so there, there's a really beautiful mechanism for, for, for that and to avoid um, any foreign bodies going down through the um, trachea down um, to the lungs. Um, so it's, the larynx has got a, a, the another part called the epiglottis, which I'm sure you all know about. Uh, it helps in the protection um, from food or liquids going down that way. Um, while that's happening, the um, vocal cords close as well, um, which essentially gives us um, protection against this um, um, and anything going down the uh, airway. So um, altogether, the larynx has nine different cartilages. Um, three of them are unpaired and six of them are paired. Um, the important ones to know about uh, is the epiglottis, which is the leaf, it is a leaf-like uh, elastic cartilage forming the anterior wall of the laryngeal inlet. So this is where you'd normally see uh, the epiglottis in, and uh, it closes down while food food is uh, uh, you know being eaten, and it has to um, go down through the opening of the esophagus. So um, that's its main function. Um, the thyroid cartilage it is the second largest part. Um, it is made from, um, in simple words, from two um, laminae coming together. Um, and the vocal cords lie at the mid-level. Now, it is quite promin prominent in males, um, which we call the Adam, uh, Adam's apple. Um, so it's uh, 90 degrees in, in males and 120 degrees in females. Um, and lastly, the cricoid cartilage, um, it is um, at the low, it just lies below the thyroid cartilage and this is an important landmark for emergency situations as well um, in situations where, where um, um, an artificial airway needs to be um, created this is uh, of prime importance um, so knowing where the cricoid cartilage um, is is very important so um, the larynx it lies from the um, at the level of c3 to c6 and usually it terminates at c6 um that's where you'll find the cricoid cartilage as well and just below the lower border of your cricoid cartilage the tracheal rings will begin um so the um <clears throat> so it like like i said the um Larynx it lies in front of the hypopharynx, which would be here, and this is where the uh, the larynx is. So the uh, um, the larynx has three different parts, which 
you know, we could roughly divide the epiglottis, sorry, the supraglottis, the glottis, and the subglottis. The epiglottis is the, no, sorry, the supraglottis is the area um, which is which starts from the base of the tongue um, and involves um, all the structures um, above the true vocal cords. Um, it includes the arytenoids, the aripiglottic folds, um, the vestibule, the ventricles, um, the base of the tongue. Um, so that's that's where what you'll call um, the supraglottis. So it's it, it it's it'll be it'll be good to know uh, when when you're you're working in an ENT department. Um, um, and, you know, having known these terminologies will help you quite a lot um, when you get patients. Um, when you're discussing patients with with your seniors or maybe uh, in emergency situations, um, so yeah, uh, this kind of gives you an idea where you know something might be happening in terms of uh, a disease or uh, any emergency. Um, right then, the glottis. The glottis is actually the area where the true vocal cords lie. Uh, remember, the false cords are a part of the supraglottis, while the true cords are the uh, at the level of the glottis and just a centimeter below that is the area called the subglottis and which extends down to the uh, um, trachea essentially then um, the larynx provide a an airway passage down to um, from from the pharynx above into the trachea below um, and then eventually the trachea uh, divides into the left and the main uh, right main bronchi entering the lungs. Right, coming to the procedures. So tracheostomy. Um, ostomy means a uh, opening. Um, tracheotomy means just making the cut. Um, so the major major difference is uh, tracheostomy is an artificial airway that we produce in emergency situations or uh, in planned. Um, Planned situations where we want to bypass the air, the normal airway, which would be either through the nose, mouth, and down from the larynx down. Um, if that is compromised, or we want to have an alternate uh, uh, passage to the lungs and for ventilation, ventilation um, and uh, oxygenation, um, a tracheostomy can be performed. So it is a procedure in which an opening is formed anteriorly directly into the trachea and the stoma is formed on the skin surface. It is followed by insertion of a tracheostomy tube which will um, go through um, in the coming slides and we'll just you know basically discuss the, uh, the different parts of the tracheostomy tube. The biggest difference here is that the entire larynx remain intact and it is not um, involved in the procedure. Um, so think think about um, um, a situation where you're called um, and uh, called down to an emergency department and somebody you know who's got limited knowledge of these procedures uh, ask you that a patient who's had a laryngectomy and his tube has fallen out, and he's not managing to breathe at all now, and that opening is closing. So immediately think um, about the possibility of it being a tracheostomy tube. I mean, there could be lar laryngectomy tubes, but that those are not um, put in that often. Um, so this is something that would help you in deciding um, what you can do and what you can't do, and what the urgency of that situation can be. All right, like as you can see in the picture, uh, that's the thyroid cartilage and that's the cricoid cartilage. Um, so a window is formed um, the level of the second tracheal ring where the um, ring is taken. So a window is formed by forming an incision um, um, at the level of the second, tra second tracheal ring. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the tube can be inserted to, through here. <clears throat> the indications for tracheostomy 
um, some of the ba most basic uh, situations where um, a patient, uh, a tracheostomy might be warranted would be infection. So in infection, just speaking very broadly, you can have um, children coming with epiglottitis and uh, adults coming with supraglottitis uh, where um, they, there's massive swelling at the back at the level of the superglottis um, or the epiglottis in children is uh, so enlarged that air cannot pass down through um, through the true cords and a patient cannot maintain his uh, saturations and uh, um, an adequate um, oxygenation is not possible in those situations uh, tracheostomy can be inserted um, can be done um, other situations like trauma in um, again with massive um, you know trauma um, laryngeal fractures or um, essentially in situations where your airway can be com compromised uh, tracheostomy can be done foreign bodies um, spe especially in in children or um, people of old age uh, you know if uh, it's an emergency situ emergency situation um, uh, tracheostomy can be done um, in old age patients usually dentures can be swallowed or um, um, you know can be obstructed in the um, cricopharyngeus or sometimes a small part of it can go down to the um, um, to the upper airway uh, and through the vocal cords and that have uh, serious um, you know consequences uh, head and neck cancers um, you may come across these situations um, in um, in situations where um, people come with a, a stridor and they're not managing to maintain their saturations and they are um, you know struggling to breathe um, and upon examination you might find large uh, base of tongue cancers or supraglottic cancers completely obstructing the um, uh, airway and that's that's another indication for it angioedema um, tongue massive big tongue swellings vocal cord paralysis due to multiple reasons can can be um, another cause uh, sorry an indication for tracheostomy um, assisted ventilation in patients on an intensive care unit where you want to wean them down uh, sorry um, and then congen children with uh, congenital anomalies um, born with maybe um, co bilateral coenal or uh, um, laryngo uh, laryngomalation in these sort of situations um, children can have um, uh, you know can go uh, undergo tracheostomy insertions. Uh, a bit about laryngectomy. So laryngectomy is a procedure where the larynx is removed. So it it could be partially taken out or completely taken out. And this is usually um, done in uh, patients with advanced laryngeal cancer or supraglottic cancers. Um, so thing to take away from the basic knowledge to take away from this presentation would be um, the larynx itself is taken out um, in a laryngectomy whereas in tracheostomy it remains intact. Um, it is a procedure in which um, the larynx is removed and the trachea is brought to the skin and uh, uh, it is fashioned into a stoma in the neck anteriorly. So the if you can see in the picture, there is no larynx there, and that's the trachea coming out of the skin. Um, it is essentially sutured to the skin, and um, air goes in, in, in and out directly through the um, this opening. Um, we this is what we call a tracheocephageal puncture and a voice prosthesis, but we'll discuss this a bit uh, further in the discussion. Uh, tracheocephageal puncture may be a form for speech. So this is, um, you know, one way uh, people without a voice box can can speak. Um, so 
it is some again something to know when you come across these sort of patients and um, when you look into the stoma and you see a little um, you know box uh, a little device there um, and it won't confuse you uh, as uh, as to you know deciding whether that's something that should be there or shouldn't be there um, so if you see something like that in a uh, laryngectomy stoma just don't get worried it's it's normal to have it there um, most common indication is advanced laryngeal malignancies of which uh, squamous cell carcinoma is the most common it's 90 to 95 percent um, in, uh, in, in in the laryngeal malignancies usually due to lifelong smoking um, HPV infections um, so while uh, uh, carriers can have, can get SCCs of the uh, larynx and family history or exposure to chemicals. Um, other potential um, reasons to get laryngeal would be posterior commissure or bilateral arytenoid tumors and post radiotherapy or uh, necrosis, uh, extensive necrosis where you um, cannot have a functioning larynge uh, laryngectomy, uh, sorry, larynx where, um, right, here's a CT scan um, showing um, a T3, T4 uh, tumor invading into the nearby um, um, structures. Right, here's a little table in which we can see what the major differences are. So tracheostomy is a bypass bypass procedure, um, um, and the laryngectomy is um, for removal of diseased larynx. So the first functional difference is to get an artificial airway beyond the blockage, and uh, and laryngectomy is to remove a diseased structure or um, or malignancy. Um, the, a tracheostomy is a reversible procedure, um, whereas laryngectomy is a permanent one. What that simply means is um, people may require uh, a, an alternate airway for short periods, um, and they could be worked up to um, be decannulated. Um, what that means is um, they can get back to using their normal uh, normal airway and uh, we can take the tracheostomy tubes out when they have adequate training and uh, um, um, and their normal function is restored um, and then in laryngectomy um, it is a, an irreversible procedure because the the larynx and some of the structures are taken out completely um, so breathing is completely dependent on the stoma um, outside the um, outside in the neck um, so you'll be breathing through that um, or the patient would be breathing through that um, so other differences functional differences in the uh, tracheostomy and laryngectomy is that there's a risk of aspiration um, in tracheostomy um, because um, there is still a connection from the oropharynx and hypopharynx down to the um, airway through the vocal cords because that remains intact. Whereas in um, laryngectomy, that's not the case because um, the um, trachea, it is separated in a way from the esophagus um, and the larynx is taken out completely so there's only a small puncture in some cases uh, it is done um, it's called a tracheoesophageal fist uh, puncture that we just discussed earlier and that could be sometimes done for um, speech prosthesis um, and so if, if you um, are eating and drinking there's a there's no no chance for that to go down to, to the airway in some cases when there this is dislodged the prosthesis it, it can be a possibility but that's not the case quite 
Um, we don't see that quite common. Um, and you can see there, there will be no chance for the food to go down. And let's just go back to the tracheostomy picture as well. Um, here you can see the vocal cords uh, intact and the tracheostomy tube is out into this, um, you know, extending from the trachea to the neck. So anything you eat may fall down um, or go down to the vocal cords. Um, excessive secretions can also pass down. Um, tracheostomy may, uh, uh, requires, always requires a, a tube um, that would need to remain in the opening, the tracheostomy opening, uh, to keep it patent. Uh, whereas in laryngectomy, that's that's not the case. Um, so you can li live a life without having a tube in the laryngectomy stoma. Um, again, it's 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 helpful to know these differences when you you, you know you're in a situation where you're called up to see a patient with um, difficulty in breathing. So having a look in the first instance, you you know you can. Um, make a plan accordingly um, because in patients with laryngectomy um, um, and you know tubes falling out laryngectomy tube is something that wouldn't uh, cause a significant airway um, um, emergency so often you you can be called um, from emergency services or ambulance services you know saying that a patient has um, his tracheostomy tube has fallen out, where, whereas that's not always the case. Um, and you can then uh, make a plan in those situations and um, not not uh, become anxious. Um, and with tracheostomy tubes, if they get dislodged, that, that's a, a different story. And in those situations, you'll need to um, the make um, you know, promptly replace it or put it back in because uh, the stoma sometimes closes very, very quickly when uh, early, early on um, uh, after the procedures. Um, right. The other one, the other difference, that, the last difference that we I want to discuss was a speaking valve. Uh, one way valves are, are used. Um, and in laryngectomy, speech is through the tracheosophageal puncture or electrolarynx. <clears throat> um, so just have a look at this picture. Um, that's a tracheostomy tube. Um, that's the balloon connected to it. Sorry, the um, area where you can inflate the balloon from. And that's a laryngeal laryngectomy stoma with a voice prosthesis in place. So as we discussed earlier, um, your speech is dependent on the tracheoesophageal puncture. So air needs to come up and go one way through this opening into the, um, through the, the, Hypo, the new hypopharynx essentially or the neopharynx and go up um, to the nasopharynx and the oropharynx to be for you to be able to speak it's it's a it's, a, it's sometimes um, called um, you know or speech therap therapists uh, say that altogether you'll have to learn speaking once you have laryngectomy so it'll, it's a completely different procedure as um, uh, or a different mechanism of speaking um, so it is a possibility and it can be done through this. Um, whereas in tracheostomies, um, it's a bit different. Um, they can, people can have uh, a speech um, prosthesis on top of the tube, uh, which allows the air to go through the tube and it's trapped and it can go up through the um, um, through the tube, if they if they those are fenestrated tubes, air can go up through the voice box into the mouth, and then you can speak again that way. Um, we're gonna just briefly discuss what the different types of tubes are in the coming um, uh, in the coming slides. So 
that will help hopefully make it e easier for you to understand what a fenestrated or non-fenestrated tube is and what could make a speech possible in tracheostomies. So just a couple of pictures of uh, tracheostomy tubes. So this is what it essentially looks like. Um, it's got, um, this is a cuffed tracheostomy tube. Um, so the cuff is essentially a balloon that sits within, um, sits around the um, the tube itself and it can be inflated to keep it in place. Um, it's got an outer cannula and into this an inner cannula can be inserted. Now the, the diameter of this is slightly narrower than the outer cannula and this is essentially put in to keep the uh, you know, ensure the patency of the tube. If this gets blocked for for any reason, you know, because of um, um, secretions or bleeding, whatever, this can always be taken out, cleaned, and you'll have a patent outer cannula. The obturator is something that's only used when you're inserting the tracheostomy tube. So this obturator will sit in the outer cannula just to make it uh, rigid enough to be put in and then it can be removed followed by inserting an inner cannula. Um, as you can see here air needs to be um, um, injected into the cuff and uh, so the balloon can be inflated to keep the keep it in place in a tracheostomy patient. Here's a a picture of a cuff tracheostomy tube. As you can see, the balloon is inflated. Uh, what that does is ensure um, the um, tracheostomy to be um, in, in place and it can um, allow positive pressure ventilations. So for uh, the, the advantage for this is uh, it allows positive pressure. So um, breathing through the tube um, uh, in patients who cannot have um, spontaneous breathing or um, who needs assisting uh, assistance in their breathing this is the best um, tube for them and it's the first to go to tube after a tracheostomy to ensure um, uh, assisted ventilation um, and again it's it's good um, for protection against aspiration as well. So as you can see there, um, if anything comes down, it it can stay down for, um, you know, um, just stay above the tracheostomy. <clears throat> um, a pressure of 20 to 25 millimeters, um, EG, needs to be maintained to avoid tracheal wall injury or aspiration. So don't want to inflate the, the um, balloon too much because that can cause pressure on the tracheal wall and that can cause you know tracheal injury and form um, false tracts in some cases or um, bleeding. Um, uncuffed tubes are the tubes that um, have that don't have the balloons and they either are fenestrated or unfenestrated. So fenestrated means the it, that air can come up from the lungs and pass up into the um, um, just above through the vocal cords. Um, so this is these sort of tubes are used for patients who do, do not require positive pressure uh, ventilation, and uh, it's better for phonation. Um, because of the fenestration so um and you know air can pass through up um, for speech it reduces the work of breathing um, because air again can pass around around the tube and there's no blockage and um, um so you can have some breathing through the tracheostomy tube and some from the your normal function if you've got you know partially um working vocal cords um and then the drawback in these is the increased risk of granuloma or tracheal stenosis uh, it usually is with fenestrated tubes because it rubs against the tracheal wall um, and it can cause gran um, 
granulation um, as well as tracheal stenosis in some cases. Other types of uh, tracheostomy tubes are adjustable flange. Uh, so you can see in this picture, some people may need variable uh, length to cover their airways. So the, the tube can be extended up or down uh, according to the desired length of the um, tube. Um, and then silver negus uh, is essentially a metallic uh, tracheostomy tube that could be uh, used for permanent tracheostomies. And this uh, has a function. Uh, it, it's, it's not used as much these days, but it, um, the risk for granulation can be reduced by using these. We're not going to go into great detail uh, uh, with regards to these. Uh, if you can identify different types of tracheostomy tubes, it would be um, a success. Um, so the tracheostomy tube and stoma care, just, uh, just so you know, the operation itself might not be the answer. Uh, stoma care uh, is as important as the operation itself because uh, it needs a lot of maintenance, a lot of cleaning, and a lot of work to um, um, retrain your body essentially to um, get used to a new airway. Um, because if you breathe air through your nose or mouth, uh, there are different uh, elements that makes the air more desirable for the body or uh, acceptable to the, to the body, which in, in simple words, um, making the air dust free or uh, hum humidification and temperature can be uh, achieved via normal airway. Whereas in a tracheostomy and a laryngectomy, it's completely different. The air is unfiltered and, um, and the temperature could not be according to the body's requirement. So it irritates the stoma as well as the trachea, um, resulting in, in increased mucin, mucus production. Um, and um, it can also result in infections due to that. So good stoma care is essential. Uh, regular um, cleaning of the tubes, the inner tubes, the inner cannulae of the tracheostomy tube, like I mentioned earlier. I'm just going to go back to the picture just to show it. So the inner cannula need, needs to be taken out every now and then and, and given a thorough clean um, with with brushes and, and uh, clean uh, water saline preferably. Um, and same goes for laryngectomy stomas as well because initially uh, it needs to be kept humidified to avoid crusting. Um, um, so benefits uh, of the stoma care includes patency of the airway we want but we want a patent airway so regular cleaning um, and to provide comfort the cleaner the stoma is um, the less irritated the area is as well um, avoid infections again um, and promotion of healing of the tracheostomy to, uh, stoma as well uh, and same same goes for laryngectomy as well um, regular dressing changes and regular stoma care will um, incre increase the chances of healing and avoid granulation uh, granulation forming, uh, formation as well. Um, it requires regular suctioning, uh, cleaning of the inner cannulas and dressing changes like we just discussed and on here, just reading, reading from here and uh, I've just realized I'm repeating myself again. <laughs> Right, go, moving ahead. Laryngectomy stoma needs gentle suctioning to avoid damage to the stoma. So remember, initially, when the operation is done, uh, you've essentially taken the entire larynx out and the trachea is, is exposed to the outside world directly. Um, and it's uh, sutured to the skin as well. So there, there might be... Uh, a lot of sutures initially, which which will need the best um, um, possible chance to heal well. So keeping it nice and moist with um, a lubricant or or an antibiotic cream 
in initially would be the best way to um, ensure good healing. Um, regular humidified air or oxygen, depending on what the requirement is for the patient. Um, regular decrusting. Um, it's it's prone to uh, crusting because of uh, unfiltered air. Um, uh, bib can be used. Uh, moistened bib can be used if you if you haven't got access to um, humidified air uh, all the time, or if you, if you're asking patient to sit in a chair or maybe going out for a walk. So a bib can be used. Um, uh, assessing tissue viability on a regular basis is quite important as well. So in some laryngectomy cases, you might come across um, different. Um, stoma different type of stomas or maybe um, some, some sometimes um, the, um, a flap can be used um, so keeping an eye on that is essential as well um, then salivary fistulas early early in um, in early days of the procedure that's uh, it's something you won't see but la later on it can happen so um, you can have false tracts or fistulae forming um, that could be that could um, have a um, you know um, that could essentially break down the uh, stoma so that's something to be aware of as well if there's any fluid coming through the neck or in, into the stoma so that might be an indicator of uh, a salary fistula. Uh, so I'm not going to go into the details of this, the immediate post-op care, um, because usually the uh, plan is, is in place. But um, just briefly, I'm uh, just very quickly, I'm going to speak about them. So. Always remember to keep the patient nil by mouth. If you're on a, let's say, on a night shift and you've got um, a new nurse or maybe someone asking you uh, whether you can feed the patient, always, always make sure the patient is is um, safe to eat or drink. If it's a new neurinjectomy patient, usually you'd want them to have two weeks with, without um, um, any um eating or drinking uh, until uh, a safe swallow is ensured. Um, that's usually done by doing a barium swallow. Um, um, the other things to remember is, is early on, um, they can um, be quite unsettled because it's quite a big procedure to go through. Um, so always ensure they have adequate um, analgesia. Um, because the more they move, the more uh, they might f find it difficult. Right. Um, we're just moving on to the last bit of the talk here. So the basic do's and don'ts for ENT SHOs. Um, first of all, identify um, if the patient is in extremis in, in emergency situations. Um, if they come with strider, ensure a safe environment where where you've got enough people to um, give you a hand um, if it's a, a blocked airway or a, an imminent blockage is is expected make sure you start the appropriate treatment uh, let's say for instance you're dealing with a patient um, an adult with a supraglottitis um, and it's got a very swollen happy um happy uh, soup, sorry, epiglottis or a supraglottic region. Um, give them, um, ensure that they are um, um, given appropriate antibiotics according to your local guidelines. Um, oxygen, um, 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 steroids, and uh, um, adrenaline and nebulizations as well. Um, so these these are the things that you'd want to do initially and uh, and just remember your abcs um in in these situations contact your seniors um and uh, critical care and anesthetics early if you think um, the patient is not going to manage um 
um, and initiate treatment in the meanwhile, like we, like we just discussed. Uh, perform a nasal endoscopy in stable patients and avoid in pediatrics under, until seniors arrive. Um, so if you're com comfortable or competent enough uh, and you're um, able to do a nasal endoscopy in a, in a patient um, who's coming with strider or um, um, AV blockage is it it is very useful because it gives gives your seniors or the anesthetics or the emergency team an idea um, as to what the urgency of um, care would be and what how, how much um, the patient can um, you know cope without having done something imminent uh, imminently uh, in pediatrics. Um, if, if it's a one-year-old, two-year-old with strider, um, call your seniors immediately. Um, you don't want to do a nasal endoscopy un until you're um, you know, advised to because you've only got one chance and the pediatric um, um, airways, they're quite narrow. So if they, they're already having strider or they're already um, you know, at a risk of having an obstruction, um, making them cry would make it worse. Um, and so always make sure you call the right people, um, which would include, again, um, critical care, anesthetics, pediatricians, your seniors, preferably um, your registrar or consultant um, to um, assess these sort of patients. Um, and a controlled um, control response can be initiated accordingly then. Um, patients with blocked tubes, always remove the inner tube and make sure the tube is patent, uh, followed by suctioning, including um, deep suction as well. Uh, Pass flexible uh, nasal endoscope or endoscope through the tube. View the trachea and the crena if possible. So a lot of, you'd see a lot of um, situations in, in in patients on different wards or maybe uh, on a night shift where you've got a new nurse um, who's not used to um, tracheostomy cares. Um, you might see patients who were struggling with their breathing and a lot of times um, it's it's a case of uh, patients having increased secretions or um, aspiration so take the inner tube out give it a good clean give the tube itself a good suction um, and use a um, suction catheter the uh, narrow ones um, pass it down uh, and make sure you've um, given it a good clean. So that will usually resolve um, um, blocked tubes in a tracheostomy patient. Um, the other thing, again, would would be really helpful um, if your um, if if information is um, required to be transferred to your seniors. Um, if you are competent or enough or, or You've got the experience to pass a nasal endoscope, flexible nasal endoscope through a stoma, be that tracheostomy or a, or a, um, a laryngectomy stoma. You can put it, uh, the camera down to have a good look and ensure there's no clot or um, or a big mucus plug sitting at the level of the carina, carina blocking the uh, bronchi. So it's of um, really um um good uh, it's, it's of really importance um at times as well um in case of this large tracheostomy tube ensure necessary equipment availability um uh, make sure uh you if you're called into in a situation where you uh will a tracheostomy tube is is um, dislodged. Um, get the patient in the right position for it. Uh, ensure that you've got a good light source, a SATS monitor, a tracheal dilator, um, and uh, um, tracheostomy tube 
that the patient has um you know the the tube that has dislodged the same the size and a size smaller to that as well just to make sure um you know you can secure the airway with uh, with um in a situation where there's uh, stenosis of the tracheostomy um it's it's pretty simple to do um it can be quite um difficult and simple um once you perform from uh, a tracheostomy change in a more controlled uh, way um, you'd be able to uh, do it without any problems in an emergency situation um, then do not remove stay sutures or stoma sutures until advised to do so um, for both tracheostomy, tracheostomy and laryngectomy stomas um, so some sometimes if if you have if you're new to the uh, department or new to st uh, stomas and tracheostomy sometimes you'll see um, sutures hanging out of these openings and uh, from either under or around the uh, tracheostomy tubes um, just make sure you let them stay in place because um, they're there for a reason in in situations where um, an airway is lost or maybe a repeat um, operation needs doing it helps locating where the opening is because um, if, if you're um, planning to head up to theaters to change a tube or maybe um, do you know uh, a procedure for whatever reason it will help you get to the uh, tracheostomy opening really quickly um, as for laryngectomy stomas initially when they are brought to the skin surface if they are sutured uh, so make sure they remain clean and and uh, um, the stoma is is adequately um, lubricated because if they dry out uh, crusting can uh, happen and, and, and in turn uh, an infection could be um, um, imminent so make sure uh, you keep the uh, the sutures on the laryngectomy stomas clean as well and don't take them out too early and give it a good chance to heal. Um, then tracheostomy stomas can bleed readily in some patients identify the bleeding areas, cauterize if appropriate, um, if, if it's granulation tissue, give trianxamic acid and um, if there's a continuous sl uh, slow trickle. So tracheostomy stomas can bleed sometimes and pe people can, um, can get really anxious about uh, these these uh, bleeds um, especially those who are not too uh, familiar with them make sure um, you have a good view of the stoma on the outside because um, granulation tissue can can form because of the stone or the tube being there in place or poor healing uh, you can cauterize those areas using silver nitrate sticks um, um, and uh, yeah give tranexamic acid if there's a continuous uh, trickle or if a, pa uh, if a patient is on um, anticoagulants you can always discuss it with your um, um, my hematology team or your seniors before um, giving tranexamic acid um, so look being able to localize where the bleeding is coming from it is again something that would help you um, and uh, it can you know um, increase um, or, or actually decrease the likelihood of something big um, coming uh, you know um, happen from happening so right um, in heavy tra tracheostomy or laryngectomy stoma bleeds um, sometimes what can happen is uh, big vessels around the, um, at the back of the laryngectomy stomas um, i.e. the um, um, carotids can be exposed because they can medialize because of the protective covers being taken away um, so if you get a massive bleed um, one way if you've got absolutely nowhere to go try, try to find a um, 
काफ ट्रे की ऑस्टमी ट्यूब और एंड्रो ट्रे की ट्यूब एंड देन सर्ट डाउन एंड पुट द काफ अप एंड होप फॉर द बेस्ट एंड कॉन्टैक्ट योर सीनियर्स एंड दिस इज समथिंग दैट कुड पोटेंशली सेव अ लाइफ um in this lot large track is again remain as calm as you can um if the patient is stable um uh, plan a reinsertion if possible if not um then um um use a new one if if needed the more calm you are the less likelihood of um the damage to the trachea itself is so if you try to force the tube in too hard and you're feeling resistance um and you're anxious and you want to get it a tube down as soon as possible in a tracheostomy patient you might do some damage that could cause problems in the, in the future and cause complications from the procedure so a false uh, tract can be formed um by by um damaging the um tracheal mucosa um in total laryngectomy patients um uh, there there have been times where um um a flap pec- pec- pectoralis major flap has been um been confused for a hematoma and unintentionally um you know with with the um unknowingly i'd say um put put a needle in to aspirate thinking that it might be a hematoma or a collection um their flap failures have um happened so make sure you know this is not a hematoma or a post op swelling or a seroma just confirm whether a patient has um you know doesn't have a um pectoral major flap or um a flap that that may um uh make the neck appear a bit larger than usual here's an example with a picture so this may look like it's a seroma or um or hematoma in early days it might look like a hematoma because of tissue being new to the area it can be of different color than this um normal skin post laryngectomy patients with jejunal flaps and pec major flaps can have flap failure in the early post op days so um again i'm not going to go in in great detail um of of the procedure itself but um some some patients who have total laryngectomies or pharyngolaryngectomies a jejunal flap is taken to form um you know a connection is made between the esophagus and the um to restore um a normal functioning um um esophagus um it, it is essential to keep eye on their inflammatory markers in the early days if they appear septic always consider flap failure so usually a, a doppler will be connected um make sure it's working fine um and the the flap is having adequate um perfusion um if the crp is significantly raised uh, let's say 400 500 600 something like that that would again um help in diagnosing uh, a flap failure um just by doing doing this and getting this information um you can again save a patient from um going um getting into catastrophic uh, results or in these situations always contact your seniors um um and that could again save patient's life and uh, um yeah right we've come to the end of the presentation um just thank you in a few different languages uh i'll end the stream now um and uh keep my voice uh the mic on thank you so much this was dr salman again